I'm sure that your moms have taught you that when someone does something nice for you or someone gives you something, what are you supposed to say? Yep. You're right. You're supposed to say thank you. Well, you know, sometimes someone does something so nice for you that you want to be able to say more than thank you. So sometimes we, we write a thank you note and we send it to them saying thank you for what you did for me. Or maybe at school someone shared a nice snack with you and you were really happy. And you can say thank you to your friend by the next time when you have something special you can share with your friend. Well, God does kind and nice things to us all the time. And we can say thank you to him in our prayers. But can we send him a thank you card? Can we send him one? Do you think if we mailed a thank you card to God, he'd get it? No, the post office doesn't deliver in heaven. And we can't really offer some food or give God a present but Jesus told us what we could do. He said that when you give something to the least of these, you do this for me. So if someone needs food and we bring them food, then we're doing that for Jesus. If someone is sick and we go to visit them, then we're doing it for Jesus. And I was thinking, we just heard about our food bank who gives food to people that don't have enough food. And I was thinking maybe we could all, big and little, think about what we can give. And next week I'm gonna bring a box and if you can bring a can of tuna, some soup, some peanut butter, some jam, some macaroni, some pasta, and we can give it in that box. And if we do that, we're doing that for Jesus. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you that you are so kind to us and you do so many things. And we just ask that you would help us to say thank you to you by helping others. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As our, good morning. Good morning. As our pastor has said, um, the scripture is taken from Matthew 5, verses 17 to 20, the fulfillment of the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the, the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. May God add his richest blessing to this reading of his holy word. As Jesus began his public ministry, there must have been much discussion amongst the people concerning him and his message. It was different. It, it had a different flavor. Up, um, it sounded uh, and looked different to them. Who was this new teacher with such power and authority? And, and what really was the nature and the substance of his message? Different groups that day, no doubt, would have loved to confirm, to have Jesus rather confirm their viewpoint and their positions on uh, various issues. Uh, that they would love to have recruited him to their cause, to be a spokesperson uh, on their behalf. But Christ was not easily assimilated or recruited to any particular party. Uh, he wasn't uh, going to sign up. Um, for the Liberals or the Conservatives or the Democrats or the Republicans. He had his own unique agenda and his own message. In this morning's passage, Jesus stakes out a position on the field of public discussion and opinion. 
He responds to the prevailing currents of debate and practice with a bold declaration of purpose and truth. The law was fundamental and central uh, to an understanding of Judaism. You couldn't understand Judaism uh, without an idea of what the law was involved with. It rose out of the past to guide and define this small group of people living in Palestine under the oppressive rule of Rome. Their history and scriptures were full of the law. It was passed down, the generations sometimes observed, sometimes ignored. And it profoundly shaped the people's understanding of themselves. They were the people in view when ages passed, the Lord had said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commands I have written for their instruction. This people, their instruction, they received the law. It was Joshua, Moses' successor, that the word of instruction and promise had come. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, and then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will go with you wherever you go. The Jews were people of the law. In the time of King Jehoshaphat, certain officials, Levites and priests, taught throughout Judah, taking with them the book of the law, of the Lord, and they went around all the towns of Judah and they taught the people. <coughs> traveling uh, preachers, if you like, traveling teachers, taking the words of the law, making sure the people heard them. In the time of the great rebuilding under Nehemiah, the leadership of Ezra and the Levites is remembered this way. Uh, it says in Nehemiah, Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And he, as he opened it up, the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and said, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They gave reference to and respect to the word of God as it was read to them. The Levites instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being said. Here we see the people at their best. Here we see them responding to the best sentiments and truths of their sacred songs and poetry. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring, Forever, the ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. A love for God's word. A taste for it. A hunger for it. An appreciation and thanksgiving for it. Such was the great value and honor that was given the law in Israel's tradition. But often the reach is less than the aspiration. The devotion of the revival in the time of Nehemiah contrasts with the situation the prophet Jeremiah faced. Here we see a different picture here where he says, How can you say we are wise for we have the law of the Lord? when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely. Many today are doing the same, handling God's word falsely, saying it, it doesn't mean what it obviously does. 
So will the prophets Amos and Zephaniah bear similar witness, respectively, saying, This is what the Lord says, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept its decrees, I will send fire on Judah. I will judge Judah. There will be a consequence. And this, woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Sounds like a description of today. Her prophets are arrogant. They're treacherous men. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. Twisted. When failure is obvious and prolonged, when disaster strikes and fortunes plummet, people can respond in different ways. Many will be discouraged and confused. That's certainly true. Depression and passivity are common. Throw up your hands, what can I do? It's out of my control. On, on either side of this large middle group, there are two extreme factions. One side, and we mentioned this a little last week too, one side would throw away the past as irrelevant and archaic, and throw off all its bothersome obligations and duties. Just forget it, it's old, it's fashioned, it's old fashioned, it's from another day. Let's go with the future. Let's embrace present realities. And for others, on the other side, the adversity affects them differently, causing them not to throw off the law, not to throw off tradition, but rather to redouble efforts to work harder and more carefully and longer. And something like this was at work in the day of Christ. This isn't new. Something like this was going on then. The nation of Israel was a pitiful remnant of its former glory under David and Solomon. They had fallen a long, long way. They had great historical memories when David had been their king and Solomon his son. And, and what a position of honor they had among the nations. Do you remember the Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon and she was so impressed with the wisdom and, and, and what she saw there. How far they had fallen from that time. There had been a spark of hope. Uh, amongst the people of Israel with the successful struggle for independence under Judas Maccabeus in the second century BC. A leader rose up to throw off those who were oppressing them and, and, and trying to um, make them turn Greek. Um, Judas Maccabeus led a revolt and was successful for a little while and so there was hope. Uh, but then came the conquest of Palestine by the Romans in 63 BC and once again they were subjugated once again they were under the thumb of foreigners in the arid experience of extinguished hope the Pharisee party attracted some to an extreme and detailed keeping of the law in the belief that only by such faithfulness would the long delayed kingdom be ushered in if we only could keep the law some thought for one day uh, then God will act and, and, and the prophecies will be fulfilled. And so to that end, their lives were devoted to the strict keeping of rules and regulations. That was their baby. And so there were rules for the Sabbath. The carrying of a burden on the Sabbath was prohibited. And in this regard, uh, you say, well, what's a burden? Well, they had an answer for you. A burden is food equal in weight to a dried fig. It's not very much. Enough wine for mixing in a goblet. Milk enough for one swallow. Honey enough to put upon a wound. Water enough to moisten an eye salve. Sabbath healing was allowed, but only within boundaries. There must be danger to life. In which case, steps could be taken to prevent the patient from becoming worse, but not any better. You can help them a little, don't let them get worse, but don't get them better, you can do that tomorrow. And so a bandage could be applied to a wound on the Sabbath, but no ointment. <laughs> a 
And so there was a great host of specific rules and regulations covering all sorts of situations and possibilities. You needed a manual. You could look it up, check it off, see if I'm doing okay. The knowledge and keeping of them was not for any people with small commitment or shallow devotion, or at least so the scribes and the Pharisees felt. Of course, there were many who held a less ticky and detailed regard for the law. They felt the disdain and the censure of the self-righteous Pharisees, and they sensed the absurdity and the inconsistency of all their petty rules. And so they weren't about to go along with them. In fact, some, in frustration and reaction against the strictness of the Pharisees, consciously and unconsciously broke the rules, returning in kind to the Pharisees the disrespect and the loathing which they understood that they were held in. Say, you loathe us, you hate us, you disrespect us, we do the same to you. But in between these two extremes, throwing off the law, forgetting it on the one hand, strict, strict observance and adherence to it on the other, in between was this great middle group, the majority of the people groping their way, trying to find what was best. And now it's against this background that we can hear Jesus defining his position regarding the law to the common people. And here's what he says. Don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. And some uh, will have been disappointed at that, for they had hoped that Jesus would confirm them in their lawlessness. That he would say, that's okay, don't worry, you're fine, carry on. But he didn't. And so the Pharisees in the group, when they heard this, must have been encouraged and hopeful. Oh, he's going to, he's going to embrace our side. But quickly their hopes would have been dashed. Jesus did say, and they, they, took, they took some encouragement from this, um, that the law was to be permanent, not the list, the list part, not even an apostrophe or the mark of an accent uh, could be taken away until everything is accomplished. He did say that. The law is not to be trifled with. It doesn't change. It's not a menu of options to choose the ones you like and leave out the ones you don't. Um, it has a fixed purpose. And there was a divine intention in its giving, and so it shall stand on the vote until that purpose is achieved. That was strong preaching, and no doubt the Pharisees uh, could barely contain themselves so far from clapping. A cheer, you can imagine, would just about to go past their lips. And so it can be today in some circles when the authority of the scripture is championed in the face of criticism as to its reliability and relevance. And we do need to affirm and reaffirm that God's will, revealed will, concerning our relating to one another and our relating with him remains unrevoked. It hasn't changed. The world, the flesh, and the devil may say what they will, and they are saying it loud and clear in these days. But the word of God remains forever. The devil contradicted God to Eve in the garden. God said this. Remember when the devil says, did God say? Right away, first thing he does is begin to put doubt on the word of God. And so that the devil continues to do so today is no surprise for us. Christ said he is a liar and the father of lies. In our prayers, asking the Lord for blessing, we need to pray also that the plans and the schemes of the devil will be confounded. That he'll not have his way with you and your family or mine and this church and this world. But Christ didn't stop there. We need to go on and hear the rest of what he said. So he goes on. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Well, again, the Pharisees would have been glad to hear that. 
Those of them who had come coolly and with great reservations to hear Christ because of rumors of his little light regard for the law must have been warming to him. Hmm, maybe he's not so bad. Maybe uh, he's okay. We can imagine them thinking and commenting to one another, this Jesus is, is bold. He doesn't pull his punches. We'll have to ask him over to speak at one of our meetings. But then came the bombshell. For I tell you, that same voice continued very evenly. I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, if you, if you break the least one, you're going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. At least you're in the kingdom of heaven. But as for the Pharisees, if, it's, if you're not better than them, you won't even be in the kingdom of heaven. And that, that's pretty blatant. What? The Pharisees' ears were burning. It was the wicked and wretches who cared not for the commandments who were to be excluded from the kingdom. But he had excluded them. How dare he? How dare he? He excluded them. He said, you're not in the kingdom. You Pharisees. The lawless ones whose ears had gone deaf at the affirmation of the law suddenly tuned in. The ones who weren't keeping the law, now they're listening. This is great. Our guys are getting it. <laughs> they loved it. They tuned in to enjoy the marvelous shooting down in flames of their adversaries. And the vast middle group were amazed. What does it mean? What does it mean? How can you affirm the law on one hand and then tell us that the people who give their whole lives to keeping it and regulating it aren't going to make it? How do you bring this together? Indeed, what does it mean? Well, for a start, it means that Jesus and not any self-appointed guardians define the meaning of the terms. It's God's law. Jesus is God's son. He tells us what it means. Righteousness is not open to our defining as accords our tradition and experience. That's what's going on today. What it means to be righteous is being redefined. What used to be wicked is now righteous. And what used to be righteous is now wicked. But we can't do that. God is not at all expressed by exclusivity, though, which looks down on those outside the group. All the petty laws and regulations that we devise are beside the point, irrelevant unless they're subservient to the great broad principles of God's law. Oh, how seductive is detail. You know, you always say the devil is in the details. We love to hide from God in a forest of detail, a forest of man-made rules which obscure and cover over, cover over the empty deadness. On the contrary, we can cast off restraint in rebellion against the hypocrisy of the rule makers, running dangerously barefoot over shards of glass. That also is happening today without restraint. But here's the problem. Both a clothed skeleton and a bare one are equally dead. It doesn't matter. You can put clothes on it, dress it up, it's still dead. Or you can throw the clothes off, it's dead. To both extremes in the middle, though, Christ comes, surprisingly, to raise the bar to a new level of righteousness, a new kind of righteousness. It's higher by far than the best keeping of rules. And so he said, keeping of rules doesn't make it. You don't make it that way. It's so high that the best jumpers and the worst cannot clear it, and yet together they're invited to enter into it. Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came to raise the bar, not to exclude all the faithless and unworthy, but to let them in. You see, that word can have two meanings. Raise the bar means make it higher and higher and higher, harder and harder and harder. That's what the Pharisees had done. But Jesus comes to raise the bar to let us all in. 
But wonderfully, once inside, there becomes available to us a new strength and agility, a new possibility, which is able to support marvelous leaps and jumps. So he raises the bar not to throw away the behavior, the way we need to live, but to enable us to do it. The law is not done away with, it is upheld and fulfilled in Christ. To be in Christ is not a license to sin. That isn't what he was saying. But it is to have a new supernatural ability to live in victory over sin. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the, the wisdom you displayed as you cut a fine line down the middle. Teaching the truth. Showing us that by our own efforts, we none of us, the worst or the best, we can make it. But that's not the point. You have come to help us make it. To give us the strength, to give us the power to do jumps and races and runs and throws beyond our ability, way beyond our ability. So as we sang today, Lord, we need a closer walk with you. Your spirit alive and fresh in our hearts so that what comes forth from our mouths and our the way we live our lives is extraordinary. To your praise and honor. Let it be. Amen. Amen.